Aislinn, daughter of the Celts. Whose people loved your kind and called you friend. Ah, the king's son. Cruel and full of trickery. This boy is not his father. I need your help. Long ago, when man was young and the dragon already old, the wisest of our race took pity on man. He gathered together all the dragons, making them vow to watch over man always. And that's why I shared my life force with a dying boy. My sacrifice became my sin. I'm in. You're unwell. You've been bewitched. Have you forgotten everything I taught you? Dragon! I love that boy and you changed him! You tricked me, dragon! No matter where you fly, no matter where you go, I will find you! I will not stop until I've rid the world of every last one of you. I am the last one! What it is! My old bedsaw! You should never have broke with me! It was you who broke with me! His father's tyranny brought him to this end. He's beyond all help. I don't want to kill you. I never did. And I don't want you to kill me. I'm going to let you up now. And if you insist, we can pursue this fracas to its final stupidity. Or you can listen to my alternative. I told you! It's all me to fight, that's all! That's not what I needed from you! I know this man who leads them, but I will not underestimate him! In late May of 1996, Dragonheart flew onto the big screen in the USA and made its way to the UK five months later in October. Produced for a large budget of $58 million, it grossed $115 million worldwide, making it a success for Universal Pictures. Directed by Rob Cohen, who had success a couple of years before with Dragon the Bruce Lee's story, and also in 1996 he directed Sylvester Stallone in the disaster movie Daylight. Critics at the time gave the film generally positive reviews, praising its light-hearted humour, its performances and of course the computer-generated effects of the Dragon Draco, voiced by Sean Connery. At the 69th Academy Awards, it was nominated for an award for its visual effects but lost out to Independence Day. With Dragonheart being aimed at a family audience, it came with a range of action figures, produced by Kenner to tie in with the movie. The figures were somewhat lacklustre and lacked much articulation, but the Dragon Draco was very detailed, making it a nice collector's piece. I don't think the toys sold very well, as I don't recall seeing them in the shops and couldn't find any TV commercials for them online. Also there were video games produced for the Game Boy and the latest 32-bit consoles. Surprisingly, three sequels were made, with one being released as late as 2017. The sequels and video games will be discussed later in the video. Dragonheart has become fondly remembered over the years for its heartwarming tale of a friendship between a knight and a dragon. The computer effects used introduced a range of pioneering new techniques, and the score to the film has taken on a life of its own, making it one of the most memorable scores of the 1990s. Dragonheart was first envisioned by Patrick Reed Johnson, who started out his career providing visual effects for the TV show V, and feature films such as Moonwalker and Bill and & Ted's Excellent Adventure. He got his chance to direct with Spaced Invaders in 1990, which proved quite successful. He had started to develop his own script titled Dragonheart, with fellow writer Charles Edward Pogue, who had written Psycho 3 and the remake of The Fly. It was pitched to producer Raffaella De Laurentiis, Patrick described it as the skin game with a dragon in it, or Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Dragon, and that he wanted the idea of a dragon and a knight conning villages for money, because he thought that concept was not only funny, but kind of sweet. Johnson and Pogue fleshed out the script, developing the characters and the old code, which the knight and lead character Bowen follows. 
Johnson and Pogue submitted it to Universal Pictures and they were impressed with it and Universal gave Johnson the green light to start making it as the script produced such a strong emotional response from the studio executives. After Universal approved the script and gave them the go-ahead, Johnson described Dragonheart as its own phenomenon that took off in Hollywood since it was a movie that everybody wanted to be involved with, from directors to composers. The approach at first was to produce a fully animatronic dragon that the Jim Henson company created and they started shooting some test footage to demonstrate what the puppet could do. From the behind the scenes footage it looks impressive, but to fully achieve what they wanted they needed a bigger budget from its relatively small offering from Universal, who gave them $21 million. Raffaella De Laurentiis, who was the producer, tried to negotiate the budget to one the studio would accept with Patrick directing. Patrick Johnson had only directed one feature film at the time, so the studio weren't fully confident in giving him directorial duties for a larger budget, and a decision was made to let him go, and they made him an executive producer and credited him with writing the story. According to Johnson, Universal saw the Creature Shop test footage as the pretext for the quality of the final film, and went behind his back trying to remove him from the project, wanting to give the production to an A-list director. Director Richard Donner had showed an interest, and he had many hits under his belt which pleased Universal but his involvement was short-lived due to casting issues. After working with De Laurentiis on Dragon the Bruce Lee's story in 1993, Rob Cohen agreed to take over as director for the film. As Steven Spielberg was competing tests for Jurassic Park around that time, Universal saw what ILM were doing and felt it would be best to wait for the effects house to finish that film as visualising the dragon in CGI instead of a large puppet would benefit the film greatly. For the casting, we have the always reliable Dennis Quaid as Bowen. The role had been originally intended for Harrison Ford when Richard Donner was attached in the early stages, and even Liam Neeson at one point. Director Rob Cohen was impressed with Quaid, saying he was intelligent and fun to work with. Quaid underwent rigorous training for the role, practicing sword fighting. Quaid and Cohen both wanted Bowen's sword technique to have an eastern flavour, so Quaid trained with a Japanese sword master. Acting legend Sean Connery was cast as the voice of Draco. Cohen said that Connery was the only actor he had in mind for the role. He described Connery's voice as unique and instantly recognisable, but said that it was what Connery stood for in life as an actor and as a man that most related to what I wanted for Draco. Sean recorded his lines in three sessions. To help the effects team, they filmed close-ups of Sean's facial expressions to help animate Draco. The very talented David Thewlis stars as Einan. David started out his career on TV before jumping on film, coming to many people's attention in the film Naked in 1993. He also starred in The Island of Dr Moreau, the same year as Dragonheart, which turned out to be a troubled production and box office disaster. Thankfully, Dragonheart found an audience. David would go on to be a familiar face of the Harry Potter series, Rob Cohen cast Thulis based on his performance in Naked, stating what makes a villain scary is the brain, not the brawn. For the scenes with young Einan, he was played by Lee Oakes. Dina Meyer, often cast as a headstrong woman, made her feature film debut the year before in Johnny Mnemonic, plays as Kara, a peasant girl who seeks revenge on Einan for killing her father. Rob Cohen stated that he needed an actress who was strong and could handle themselves with double Viking axes and look believable, and Dina got the part. Dina has continued to have a successful career on film and TV, most notably in the Saw films and the Paul Verhoeven classic Starship Troopers. The late and highly respected Pete Pothelswaite plays as Gilbert, a monk and aspiring poet who joins Bowen and Draco in the revolt against Einan. Gilbert was the film's comic relief. Cohen cast Pothelswaite after being impressed with his performance in The Name of the Father. The 90s saw Pete's career take off on the big screen, starring in The Usual Suspects, The Lost World, Romeo and Juliet and Amistad, making him a familiar face for moviegoers around the world. The always awesome Jason Isaacs plays as the snivelling Lord Felton, Einan's second in command and often wants to avoid conflict and is more concerned about himself. This was one of Jason's first big blockbuster acting gigs. He would go on to star in The Patriot, Event Horizon, Soldier, Black Hawk Down and like David Thewlis, would star in the Harry Potter series as Lucius Malfoy. Called the most poetic of all actresses by Al Pacino, Julie Christie stars as Queen Ashlyn, Einan's mother. Julie hadn't acted for a number of years and Cohen found Christie through David Thewlis' casting agent. Julie has starred in many highly regarded films, such as Dr. Zhivago, Fahrenheit 451, Don't Look Now and Heaven Can Wait. And last but not least, everyone's favourite supporting heavy is Brian Thompson as Brock, Einan's knight who served alongside Einan's father when he was king. Brian is a familiar face of action films such as Cobra, Lionheart and played as Shao Kahn in the god-awful Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Filming began in July 1994 in Slovakia. Quaid would spend most of his time interacting with a pole with a bar and two red circles at the top. 
as an indicator for where Draco's eyes would be for Quaid's reference. They also set up speakers through which Cohen would read Draco's lines for Quaid, which Quaid said really helped him with his performance. While filming the scenes involving Draco in flight, the crew used a micro light as reference and then edited the footage to put Draco over the top and removed any traces of the aircraft. With Rob Cohen on board as director, he started making changes to the script, and the writers Johnson and Pogue weren't particularly happy, which they both revealed years later in interviews. They felt at the time, Cohen was taking credit for things that weren't his to take credit for. They felt undermined and their contributions neglected. According to Pogue, he felt the director had neither the poetry in his soul nor the panache to bring Dragonheart to the screen. The writers disagreed with Cohen's desire to showcase Draco as the film's main attraction, which caused vital scenes of the film to be dropped, and as a result made the film inconsistent and rushed with its storytelling. With Universal aiming to turn Dragonheart into a more of a kid's movie, Pogue felt the dark and serious elements were either removed or dumbed down, resulting in silly dialogue being added that reduced the serious tone that Johnson and Pogue had originally intended. Cohen reduced the Queen to a glorified bit player, and the love story between Kara and Bowen was heavily reduced. There are some signs there is something between them in the final cut, but Rob felt that she should be more of an action oriented character, and didn't really have faith in the love story. Other changes to the script damaged the character of Einan. Johnson envisioned Einan as a quiet and confident villain with a sense of unpredictability that would go crazy once he realised that his fate is connected to Draco's but the revisions turned Einan into a brat who constantly shouted and the character they felt couldn't be developed. After the initial filming had finished, Rob had started work on Daylight in Rome and would review sequences of Dragonheart from ILM via a satellite hookup and would advise them on changes to the animation and give them feedback. As the effects took a long time to render and complete, they spent an additional 13 months to finish the film, making the budget jump from its original $21 million to $58 million. The story is set in 984 AD, where we see Bowen train the young Prince Einan in the ways of the old code, in hopes he will become a better king than his tyrannical father, King Frayn. During a battle with the peasants who have rebelled against the king, the king is killed and Kara accidentally causes Einan to be mortally wounded as he goes to retrieve his father's crown. Einan's mother takes her wounded son to a dragon in hopes it would save his life. The dragon replaces Einan's wounded heart with half of its own, on the promise that Einan will rule with justice and virtue. However, Einan becomes more evil than his father and enslaves the former rebels to rebuild a Roman castle. Bowen feels Einan is bewitched and blames a dragon and makes a promise to hunt down and kill all the remaining dragons throughout the land. Jumping 12 years later, Einan's castle is rebuilt and Bowen has become a skilled dragon slayer. Brother Gilbert bumps into Bowen and observes him in action and records his exploits. Bowen stalks a dragon to its cave. The dragon manages to flee but is caught by Bowen, but he can't hold the dragon for long and is dragged through the forest. The confrontation ends in a stalemate. A dragon makes it clear that he is the last of his kind and if Bowen kills him, he will be out of business. So they instead form a partnership to defraud local villagers with staged dragon slayings. Bowen names the dragon Draco after the constellation and doesn't know that Draco is the dragon who shared his heart with Einan and shares his pain. Kara breaks into Einan's castle and attempts to kill him for her father's death, but fails and is locked away. Einan remembers her as a young girl and what she did to him and attempts to seduce her and make her his queen. Einan's mother despises what her son has become and helps Kara escape. Bowen is continuing to fool the locals with his fake dragon slaying and Kara calls him out for his lies, but Bowen makes her look foolish and the people of the village sacrifice her to Draco. After the dragon takes her away and back to his lair, Einan arrives to recapture her and battles with his old master Bowen. As they do battle, Einan reveals he never believed in the code and was only using Bowen to learn how to fight. Bowen is heartbroken and starts to lose the battle. Draco intervenes and reveals his half heart, causing Einan to panic and flee. Kara asks Bowen to help overthrow the king, but Bowen has lost confidence in himself and the old code. But luck has it, he gets a vision from King Arthur, who restores his confidence to take down Einan, but he knows he'll lose a friend in the process. Visual effects company Industrial Light and Magic handled the effects for Dragonheart. Director Rob Cohen rounded up a team of some of the biggest names in the effects business with Scott Squires who worked on The Mask, Phil Tibbett who worked on The Empire Strikes Back, Robocop and Jurassic Park, and visual effects supervisor Kit West who had just recently worked on Stargate. As dinosaurs had been brought to life three years earlier in Jurassic Park, they used many of the same techniques used on that in Dragonheart, but the challenge was extending the use of the computer effects and making the dragon talk. 
If you total up the amount of CGI used in Jurassic Park, they used roughly 7 minutes worth, but with Dragonheart they pushed it up to 23 minutes. It took them nearly two years to complete the effects. In the early stages of the CGI conception, visual effects producer Judith Weaver and her team did a screen test for Dragonheart months before actual storyboarding, using a stretched out version of the T-Rex from Jurassic Park as reference. Phil Tippett, who specialised in creature design and character animation, was hired to work on animating Draco. Tippett stated that Dragonheart differed from what they did for Jurassic Park in that they were mostly responsible for the actual look and design of the dragon. Rob Cohen's ideas for Draco's design stemmed from the traditional Chinese guardian lion, which he described as having a lion-like elegance and fierceness. Phil Tippett and his crew created a five-foot model of Draco for lighting reference and an articulated model that could be used for as reference for Draco's poses. The film is notably the first to use ILM's caricature software, as it was developed to help lip-sync Draco's animation to Sean Connery's voiceover work. Back in 1996, seeing these effects were really impressive and were a great achievement, but a lot has changed in 23 years, and there has been so many creatures visualised on screen and even more dragons, so its big selling point of seeing a fully realised dragon has lost a lot of its uniqueness. Some of the shots have held up to scrutiny and others less so. Draco has issues with shadows and dynamic lighting, so it doesn't quite blend well in some shots with the live action elements. The difficulty for the team is that there are so many daytime shots which makes it very difficult to hide its limitations. The nighttime sequences are pretty much flawless. ILM did a great job at the time and their efforts helped facilitate the next steps in the CGI revolution. Randy Adelman composed the score to Dragonheart. Originally, Jerry Goldsmith was attached to the production in its early stages, but as directors changed, Rob Cohen brought on his frequent collaborator Randy, who he worked with on Dragon the Bruce Lee's story, Daylight, and later The Mummy 3. The score came out on CD in May of 1996, containing 15 tracks, totaling around 45 minutes of music. Certainly not complete, and sadly hasn't been re-released over the years in any expanded form, so the CD has been out of print for some time, but thankfully it is available on digital platforms to purchase. This is definitely one of the best fantasy scores of the 1990s. I think the score has become more memorable outside of the movie, especially the track The World of the Heart. The scene at the end when Draco dies, it fully pushes that theme. This music was used for the sequels and was used many times for trailers for other movies such as Two Brothers, Mulan and Seven Years in Tibet. I'm guessing Randy Adelman has made more money out of licensing his music than he was paid to score the film perhaps. Randy's scores tend to have a mix of electronic music and orchestral pieces. With Dragonheart it's the same approach, but those electronic compositions are replicating musical instruments, which isn't for everyone. You could argue this style of score doesn't fit this film and this time period it's dealing with. When you listen to James Horner's Braveheart score from the year before, that sounds more in keeping with the style of that period. But for some reason Randy's work fits the movie really well, despite being dominated by its electronic equipment. Randy injects enough thematic grandness to compensate. As the film has elements of action, humour, villainous characters and strong emotional beats, it tries to accommodate everything, which is a tough balancing act. For example, the track Bowen Rides, for the scene where he is chasing after a dragon to kill it, it's this joyous, upbeat melody that is accompanying a sequence where Bowen is out to kill. It's strange tonally, I think, but somehow it works. I'm a big fan of Randy Adelman's work throughout the many movies he has worked on, but surprisingly a lot of his scores are out of print and haven't been expanded. Fingers crossed his scores for this and others like Dragon the Bruce Lee Story and Ghostbusters 2 get that special edition treatment in the near future. Now there were video games released based on the movie for the PlayStation, Saturn, PC and even the Game Boy. First up was the Game Boy version released in time for the movie, developed by Taurus Games and published by Acclaim. This is an RPG where you play as Bowen tracking down dragons and eventually meeting Draco and teaming up to defeat Einan. You can choose what you want to say to people to decide what direction to take, so it can be a different experience every time you play it. Presentation wise the graphics are detailed for a Game Boy game, taking on a first person perspective as you travel the land. This does something interesting with the movie license, instead of being another run of the mill platforming game. The reviews at the time were very strong, they praised its story and graphics but some pointed out it was lacking any real challenge. Certainly worth grabbing if you see it at a retro gaming convention or if you want to emulate it on your PC or Apple Mac. Now here comes one of the worst movie licensed games for the fifth generation consoles. Funcom developed a typical hack and slash platformer, plays very much like the terrible Sword of Sodan. 
If you've ever played that for the Amiga and Mega Drive, you'll know what I mean. The game was titled Dragonheart Fire and Steel. This came out in November of 96 in the USA and in the UK in March of 97. It was met with overwhelmingly negative reviews due to its simplistic gameplay, poor controls and jerky animation, making use of rendered backgrounds making it difficult to see what you could interact with. It's surprisingly quite a difficult game to play due to its clunky controls. It's very funny when Bowen dies, they seem to have sampled a sound effect of what appears to be a farmer getting punched in the nuts. I remember reading the review for this game in the official Sega Saturn magazine, where it was awarded with 27%. Massive stinker. This game performed so badly in the UK, selling possibly as little as 100 copies on release, apparently reported by Games Master magazine years back, making it one of the worst selling video games of all time. Prices do vary on it on the second hand market, but it appears pretty pricey now, especially for the Sega Saturn. If you are a collector, you obviously need to complete your collection, but everyone else, avoid it at all costs and stick to the Game Boy release. With the success of Dragonheart on the big screen and with it being a big hit on home video, Universal Pictures commissioned a sequel in 2000 to be produced for DVD called Dragonheart The New Beginning, directed by Doug Leffler who had worked on a number of Sam Raimi productions as a second unit director. This sequel stars Christopher Mattison from Malcolm in the Middle as the lead Joff. It takes place years after the death of Draco and Sir Bowen, not played by Dennis Quaid of course, returns to the home of Draco and finds an egg. He gives the egg to a monastery and shortly after he dies. The friars pledge to hide the dragon away and care for it. Joff, who dreams of becoming a knight, discovers a dragon called Drake and becomes friends with it. It's clear its production budget is very low and is aimed for the home video market and TV. So it comes with those glaring restraints, especially on the CGI creation of Drake. It's not terrible though, but they do however limit the use of the dragon to cut corners and they recycle background plates from the first film as Drake flies over the villages and uses his fire breath, a glaring sign of their limited budget. Some of the performances are okay and others are a bit clunky and wooden. Honestly, it's harmless and not the worst sequel ever made and would entertain young kids, but it is ultimately very forgettable. 15 years later, they returned to the series with a third entry called The Sorcerer's Curse, which went direct to DVD and Blu-ray. This story takes place 100 years before the events of the first film, and the dragon is voiced by Ben Kingsley. The story focuses on an aspiring knight of the old code called Gareth, who goes in search of a fallen comet rumoured to contain gold. He is shocked to instead find a set of dragon eggs guarded by a dragon. The eggs are stolen and Gareth is hurt in the process. The dragon, later named Drago, saves Gareth's life and the two become bonded. Once bonded, the dragon can now speak English, which is something the other films didn't touch upon. They must now work together to defeat an evil sorcerer, who has also cursed a dragon rendering the creature powerless during daylight, or by the light of a flame, meaning the dragon will be under the sorcerer's control by the full moon featuring a far larger budget than the previous film, and certainly better directed and with far superior visual effects. The film makes attempts to expand on the old code which the character Bowen followed in the first film. The film takes on a darker look with a lot of colour taken out of it, making it look a bit grey and dull throughout, with many scenes taking place at night. The film received favourable reviews, with many praising the effects for a director dvd release. It's certainly better than part 2 and the voice of Ben Kingsley makes the scenes with the dragon entertaining, but I wasn't wowed by it. It's serviceable as a sequel and makes up for the sloppy efforts on part 2. The fourth entry into the series, Dragonheart Battle for the Heartfire, arrived in 2017, with it taking place about 70 years after the events of Dragonheart 3. When the king dies, the dragon who shares his heart must find a new ruler for the throne. Drago, this time voiced by Patrick Stewart, must find a successor as the king has apparently no children, so the dragon seeks out his relatives. Drago discovers a man with strong dragon-like strength, and he is made the king, but it's discovered he has a twin sister, making her as well entitled to the throne. Drago's mission is to try and end the rivalry between them. Like part 3, this has strong production values for its intended DVD audience. I found this one slightly more enjoyable as it was more light-hearted and didn't take itself as seriously. The Dragonheart series is one of those franchises where most people don't even know there were sequels produced. I knew there was a second film, but before this review, I had no idea parts 3 and 4 existed, and there was a fifth one in production. If you said to someone they made three sequels to the original 1996 film, you'd be like, what? Really? Why? It's clear there is still an audience for this series, as they wouldn't have made so many. What really stood out to me throughout watching these sequels was composer Mark McKenzie's work on all of them. He mainly works as an orchestrator and worked on dozens of big movies and it's clear he is a great composer in his own right and his scores to these movies are worth checking out. I saw Dragonheart back when it came out in theatres. There was a bit of buzz surrounding it because it had a dragon fully realised on screen in CGI. It seemed quite exciting. 
We had Jurassic Park three years earlier which made such a huge impact and fully shifted the move from animatronics and puppetry to computer generated imagery successfully. CGI was this new tool that made special effects more exciting especially to a younger audience. For a teenager being addicted to video games and seeing a lot of coverage on computer graphics at the time on dedicated shows to video games, it made both of them seem connected in some way. So going to watch the latest blockbuster that incorporated CGI was something that intrigued me. Of course the whole CGI approach lost its charm very quickly as we began to see more films take advantage of it and often the case that the visual effects were becoming too ambitious for the time and dated very quickly compared to the old school methods of the past. Dragonheart wears its heart on its sleeve and its emotional beats work very well. I think that's one of Rob Cohen's skills as he displayed it very well in Dragon of Bruce Lee's story. The film however is a bit of a strange beast so to speak. It deals with serious themes but plays around with them loosely to either throw in a gag or an action sequence. As the story has been streamlined with a change of director we don't get much in the way of supporting characters interacting with Bowen in any meaningful way. Kara has her own motives to avenge her father and spends the majority of the movie being very short tempered and complaining most of the time, making her not a very likeable character despite her good intentions to get rid of the king she doesn't actually get to fulfil her mission as Bowen has to sacrifice Draco. It may be a bit cheesy to have another film with a forced romance, but I wouldn't have complained if Bowen and Kara had a stronger connection to form a relationship than what the film only hints at. The monk clearly is used for comic relief and Pete Pothelswaite does a wonderful job with the part. When it comes to training for the final battle against Einan, he is unaware that archery is easy for him. It's all very convenient for the plot but a typical move by the director to cut through time. Ultimately his character feels underdeveloped and doesn't get enough screen time to make his character worthwhile to the story. Dennis Quaid is always fun to watch on screen, I loved him in Inner Space and Enemy Mine. He has that leading man look and has demonstrated many times he can deliver a dramatic performance. As Bowen he does a good job with the part and is confident on camera with his sword fighting and the emotional conflicts with Aynan, but I do ultimately think he is miscast if they're gone with say Liam Neeson. That would have been really interesting and I think would have shifted the tone of the film to reflect Liam's style of acting. David Thewlis is a fine actor and has turned in so many great performances over the years like Dennis Quaid and in Dragonheart he plays up the part of being a really nasty person. As mentioned earlier in regards to the changes of the character from his original conception, I think there could have been more conflict in his mind or perhaps he could have dialed back his rage because we don't really get inside his head. We see him thinking about stuff but he never speaks about his feelings, it's just pure anger. He's just out to punish the people and reap the rewards. It would have been nice to see a kinder aspect of him near the end where he knows he's going to die, just have a sense of him pleading with Bowen to spare his life, but Rob Cohen keeps him just as a straight up bad guy all the way through it. Sean Connery's voice is so distinctive it's hard to imagine anyone else providing their talents to the dragon. Maybe Ian McKellen? I don't think Sean had provided his voice to an animated character before this, I couldn't find anything on IMDb. Despite just doing his regular voice, he sounds regal giving the dragon a sense of importance and history. He dials in the King Richard performance he did for Robin Hood Prince of Thieves for his quick cameo in that movie. With it being shot in Slovakia, it thankfully doesn't suffer from that American backdrop some fantasy films have with their attempts with a lower budget. It has a European vibe to it but also doesn't look like England, where I think it's attempting to be set. It would have been wise to shoot in Ireland or Wales to give it that required backdrop as many movies have done in the past like Excalibur for example. It's not clear how far the king's reach is. It seems he's only causing trouble for a few locals. Bowen seems to go unnoticed throughout the land for nearly a decade without the king noticing or caring for that matter as he attempts to hunt down the remaining dragons. The world of Dragonheart ultimately feels very small, focusing just on the castle and nearby villages. You don't really get a good sense of the geography of the land, everything just appears too close to one another. What I noticed while re-watching it again after a number of years is that the plot follows similar beats to Robin Hood Prince of Thieves. Of course it's dealing with different characters, but it has moments that make you think Dragonheart borrowed a few elements from that film, like Bowen training the peasants to attack the king or in the case of Robin Hood it's the Sheriff of Nottingham and the king trying to get the affections of a woman who clearly hates him. Dennis Quaid is doing an American accent, sometimes it has hints of an Irish one, just like Costner doesn't really bother to change his voice and is also rocking a mullet. I may be overthinking it but I couldn't help notice those similarities while watching it again. I think the mythology of the dragons could have been deeper and more insightful. It cuts through a lot at the beginning and only touches upon the dragon's importance as Draco dumps some exposition. We only see one other dragon outside of Draco but only in shadow. It's clear the budget restraints limited them to feature only one dragon. It's evident that the sequels try to expand on the dragon mythology and the old code. 
but most people haven't really gone out of their way to see them and the film just provides the bare minimum to get the story moving forward, which is fine at the end of the day as you have to consider its runtime and the young audience but it all comes off as too simple and not very engaging sadly. You could say there isn't much meat on its bones. The action is okay throughout the movie, the sword fights are well staged and seeing Draco attack the towns and castle are nicely shot as the CGI dragon interacts with the live action elements, but the big battle between the peasants and the king and his followers is lacklustre and lacks any energy. It seems a bit clumsily staged and is only in service to witness the king being shot with an arrow to bring Draco down for his capture. Draco only briefly attacks the castle and with the fight in the forest being a bit bland it does make the third act a tad unexciting. They make up for it with the sword fight between Bowen and Ainan but they don't have much dialogue to create some emotional tension between them. Dragonheart is fondly remembered by the kids who grew up in the 90s. It made an impact at the time thanks to its advances in computer imagery but has largely fallen by the wayside and is just regarded as another 90s summer blockbuster that is fun and entertaining but is largely forgettable in the grand scheme of things. I think with a director with a stronger vision and who took the source material more seriously and played less of the comedy and aiming to entertain a younger audience it could be considered more of a classic and a traditional sense. I do sympathise with the writers who felt their script was dumbed down but it's movie making and it's a business and you want the film to appeal to as many people as possible. You have to play it safe sometimes and Rob Cohen gave the studio what they wanted and it was successful. I still have fun watching it every couple of years, it's no masterpiece but it doesn't have to be. It ticks enough boxes to keep you smiling and laughing. You can pick it apart easily which I've already done but despite those issues I would still recommend it to people who haven't seen it because it does have a lot of charm and a solid sense of adventure plus a cracking score by Randy Adelman that will pull at your heartstrings. I remember you, your hair like fire. You gave me this scar. I owe you. It was you. Your heart beat to Nynan's breast. Yes, my half heart that cost me all of my soul. Even then, I knew his bloodthirsty nature, but I thought my heart could change him. God, I was so naive. No more than I. All my life I've dreamed of serving noble kings, noble ideals. Dreams die hard and you hold them in your hands long after they've turned to dust. I will not be that naive again. You want us to follow you and a priest against Ainan? Yes. It's a hell more like. But this time we can win, you don't understand. I don't want to understand. I understand this. I understand six years in a quarry. That's all I need to understand. Save your strength for the fight against Ainan. There isn't any fight against Ainan. I'm going to start one. You and what army, knight? He dares defy me at my own gates. Look at him! Well, today his code dies once and for all! I know why you brought me the Dragon Slayers. You wanted them to kill him because you wanted me dead. I go to save the dragon! Who will go with me? I wanted to correct a mistake. You will never win until Ainan's evil is destroyed. And to do that, you must destroy me. I hope you enjoyed the video, be sure to subscribe to see more retrospectives and commentaries. Also click on the bell to be notified of the latest reviews. If you want access to exclusive videos and to watch my content a few days before it's on YouTube, you can head on over to my Patreon. Thank you very much.